Hi everybody and welcome to Smart Talk, the Henry George School series of video interviews with some of today's leading economic and finance policy thinkers. I'm Alan Tonelson. I'll be your host today. I'm a trustee of the Henry George School and I'm also the founder of a public policy blog called Reality Check. I'm very pleased today uh, to be able to present to you one of the most insightful economic and finance policy analysis that I know of, Edward Harrison. Edward is a former career diplomat, former investment banker, and technology executive with more than 25 years of business experience. He has also been a regular commentator on economic and finance issues for the BBC World News, CNBC, the Business News Network, the Canadian Broadcasting System, and Fox Television. He speaks six languages, he reads five more, and he holds an MBA in finance from Columbia University and a BA in economics from Dartmouth College. Edward is also the founder of a fascinating website that covers the economic and financial worlds called Credit Write Downs. The articles by the stable of authors that he's assembled, and they are first rate, have also appeared in newspapers and magazines such as Britain's Guardian, Reuters, The Financial Times, Forbes, and The New York Times. Well, once again, Edward, thanks so much for joining us here on Smart Talk. And let's start off by examining the state of populism, uh, maybe more on the European side of the Atlantic, since I have a feeling that most observers and most of our, of our viewers would find the American story, if it's not simple, at least there's basically one storyline. Mm -hmm. But in Europe, obviously, we've got, we've got many storylines. And it seems to me that last year there was tremendous concern that the Brexit vote, which started the process of bringing the United Kingdom out of the European Union, had really touched off a, a or, or, or threatened or promised, depending on your standpoint, to, to, to generate a major wave of populist discontent that would sweep over the entire European Union and various other related European countries. Um, and it seemed to be inevitable because the economies were so unpromising and people were so angry about so many things. And then came a series of elections on the continent, especially France, where a more mainstream, sort of emphatically, explicitly anti-populist candidate won. Where do we stand now? Well, you know, interestingly, uh, when, you, when you mentioned Macron there, uh, I, would, I would say that he's like, uh, a populist of sorts in the sense mm. that um, he is, uh, you know, as veering toward the populist uh, uh, view mm. that you can be within the mainstream, meaning that he uh, said, look, I'm, a, I'm my own man, I'm my own party, I'm actually working for you. True, right. You know, he took a lot of the, you know, the populist right. uh, rhetoric and right. put it within the constraints of, of the mainstream of centrist type of ideology. So I think it's, he's a very interesting character. Hmm. But you know, to your main question, mm -hmm. I think the interesting bit is, is that you have multiple strains there, as you were saying, because you have multiple countries, but there are a lot of different things that are going on. Mm -hmm. You have the EU on the one hand, right. you have uh, globalization mm -hmm. and just general sort of stagnation in the middle class in the second, and then mm -hmm. you have sort of a split, I would say, between East and West on those issues, especially with regard to immigration, right. where in the East, uh, immigration and, and, and going all the way to Germany has become a much more virulent issue sure. in terms of uh, raising popul populism. So just going back and looking at it from the electoral standpoint, I would say that the conception that Brexit was the high point of populism is probably erroneous. Mm. That just because the populists mm. weren't able to get what they wanted in France and in the Netherlands and in Germany and various other places, Poland in particular, uh, doesn't mean that right. they are a spent force going forward. I really think that r the economy has improved dramatically. Right. We're talking about the bad economy, it's improved and right. that's taken a little bit of steam out of them. Right. But also that really uh, they're still waiting 
for that economy to, uh, to, to turn down. The, the thing for me that I think is most interesting when you think about this mm. is Germany. Mm. Okay, here's a country that is doing the best in all the major countries. We're, we're talking France, Germany, Italy, Spain, right. and uh, the, the big countries of, of Europe, uh, the UK. And yet the AFD, that's the Alternative for Deutschland right. party, which is a non-mainstream, a populist party. Mm -hmm. Some even call them neo-Nazi sympathizers. Right. Mm -hmm. um, this party it took all of the votes away from Angela Merkel's party, who's right. the chancellor. Mm -hmm. And she is the most popular politician in Germany. Right. So how's right. that possible if mm -hmm. the economy is doing well? Right. And uh, you have the most popular politician in, in Germany. The two of those would suggest that underneath the surface, there's still a, a, a huge strain right. of populism that will continue to manifest itself, uh, especially when the economy turns down. And I think one of the, the most interesting points that you've raised in your various writings for credit write-downs and, and elsewhere is that we've seen what looks like a pretty healthy upturn in Europe's economic fortunes. Um, there seems to be a continent-wide recovery that's, uh, that's gathering momentum, that seems broad-based. Uh, the various economies seem to be roughly, roughly in sync with each other, and yet these resentments and this anger and this frustration still persist. Right. And it makes me wonder whether or not a main problem with these European economies is a problem that, that we've experienced here in the States, which is that growth or growth benefits have not been shared in, in any remotely equal way. And in fact, just yesterday, we got news here in the US that inflation-adjusted wages for October fell. Mm -hmm. So um, clearly, wages in this recovery have been a huge problem. They've lagged well behind virtually every other economic indicator. So is that part of the problem that we're seeing in most of Europe's countries today? Definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that you know, when you talk about the United States in particular, uh, most people would say in America when they've done polls that we have no problem with people making uh, gobs of money. Right. Steve right. Jobs, if he wants to make uh, billions of dollars mm -hmm. uh, because he's a great inventor, great. Bill Gates, uh, you know, we, we take nothing against him for yeah. inventing Microsoft. So it's not about the envy. Right, okay? right, sure. It's about right. the fact that, just as you said, the mm -hmm. stagnation, Brexit. Mm -hmm. Of all the European economies, uh, the UK has done the worst of the major economies mm -hmm. on an inflation adjusted basis in terms of wages. Right, you right. Know, since 2008, right. wages have gone down on an mm -hmm. inflation adjusted basis. Right, that's, wow, that's the sort of thing, that's the impetus behind. Uh, things like Brexit. So it's not that the people are saying, okay, inequality is increasing and therefore right. uh, we're upset and we don't want to see the rich get richer. Right. It's rather that, you know, this economy is growing. We see right. the stats, we hear the numbers, right. uh, we, we see what's around us, but yet we, that is me and my, my, my friends, my family, we're not benefiting in that. Especially I, if we live in a place like Manchester or like Liverpool exactly. rather than a place like London. Right. right. It, it, you know, when you live in the north, you know, Newcastle, mm. you know, Bradford, places that old, old line uh, manufacturing outposts, right. those are not doing anywhere near as well. Right, right. Now, what actually one interesting question, at least to me, mm -hmm. that this brings up is it, it raises the question of how effective has the European welfare state been in shielding people from the economy's downs? Um, because I think certainly in the U.S. there's a widespread impression that European welfare states, European safety nets, call them what you will, are more generous, they're mm. more extensive, um, and they do a, a much better job of enabling people to live reasonably adequate lives when the economy, all told, gets very, very bad. But it seems like either that's not the case or these welfare states are now running across challenges that just weren't expected. Yeah, I think that it, uh, you, you hit the nail on the head in the sense that um, 
these welfare states definitely uh, are more porous than they were before. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's in part because the welfare states have been rolled back uh, as a result of um, changes in I ideology around what's affordable. Um, you know, Sweden is a perfect example mm -hmm. that the, the Scandinavian countries have rolled back. If you look at the numbers, in terms of poverty mm -hmm. uh, in places like Germany, as an example, right there, you know, there, uh, they, there are a lot of people who are working and who are still poor. Uh, right. uh, the, it, if you were to take benefits in Germany, uh, you're just barely getting by. So the concept right. that it, it's uh, it's great is erroneous. It's better than the United States. But it's right. definitely not as beneficial as it once right. was. And in fact, I, I recall reading a few months ago that Germany, despite uh, its, its very considerable success on the manufacturing front, on the export front, in terms of areas of economic performance that you would think would bring major benefits to middle class workers, on top of the the impressive record that the medium-sized, uh, the small and medium-sized family-owned German manufacturers have achieved for, for a long, long time, and still are, um, you've had a big wage lag problem there too. And in fact, I'm not. Sh it, it's probably an exaggeration to say that the the latest phase of the German export miracle is built upon low wages. But maybe it's not such a great exaggeration. It's not such a great exaggeration. And by the way, let me uh, add to uh, the last question mm -hmm. that uh, if the statistics just came out recently about birth death uh, oh. uh, in Germany, and actually more people died than there were live births in Germany. Uh -huh. So you have the demographic right. issue, sure. and this has really sure. been a huge player in terms of their, be their belief in the sustainability of the welfare state. And you have to remember, they are currency users meaning that they gave up monetary sovereignty. So, mm -hmm. the, you know, they're very worried, the Germans and all the rest of the Eurozone, about their ability to pay for uh, the, the, the economic model that they've created. Right. And so they rolled right. it back for right. partially for those mm -hmm. reasons. But, you know, that's another thing mm -hmm. uh, with regard to the Euro. Germany, they understood, you know, having taken in uh, combined East and West together, that when it turned, actually, they, the, wages, the wage structure in Germany was difficult, mm -hmm. especially as compared to, say, Hungary or the Czech Republic or Poland, et cetera. So you saw a massive out-migration of manufacturing from Germany right. to those places right. uh, in the EU. Mm -hmm. And in order to stop that from happening, you know, to prevent Germany from becoming the sick man of right. Europe, right. unions, uh, uh, corporates, and government got together and they created a great pact mm -hmm. which said we will throttle wages over mm -hmm. a, a certain period of time right. in order to make sure that uh, people still remain employed. Sure. That we, we aren't exporting jobs out. And by and large, that worked. It worked. You know, mm -hmm. in conjunction with a euro which was, relatively speaking, less uh, um, valuable because sure. of uh, inflation in other countries. Sure. The Germans, therefore, I think you could make the case, as you j did in your mm. question, uh, they have benefited from wage suppression. It isn't right. that the wages themselves are low. Right, right. It's rather that on a relative basis, right. <coughs> uh, in terms of productivity growth, right. the Germans uh, over the last decade, the last two decades, have done much better than, say, the Italians right. or the, the Spanish. Right. Now, there seem to be two major differences between the European version of populism, to the extent that one can generalize across countries, and the, and the, the U.S. version. And I'd like to talk about them uh, each in turn. First of all, it strikes me as being very peculiar that in Europe there's no version of Bernie Sanders. Mm. There doesn't seem to be much energy um, on the left end of the spectrum for any programs or policies that could legitimately be called populist. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm wrong about that, let me know. But if I'm right, why would that be, do you think? 
Well, you know, I think it has to do with uh, where the societies are. You know, I'm thinking about that question uh, in terms of how well they've done economically and why yeah. it might be. But because if you look across the swath of northern and eastern Europe, what you see is right wing populism. And by the way, right. when the economy mm -hmm. is bad, generally speaking, it has been the right wing populists who have gained, mm -hmm. you know, they've done studies uh, at um, populist uh, uh, revolts and, and economic. Historically so speaking. Right. Uh, sorry. Historically speaking. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So they've done studies about historically, you know, where we've seen populists, and, right. and you know, they have some definitions of you know how the economy is doing, whether they're right or left. And what they found is is that right wing populists uh, tend to do better in starkly negative economic mm -hmm. times. Yet, when you look across the swath of Europe, what you see is is in the northern parts, and that includes the UK, mm -hmm. we're talking about France with Marine Le Pen, mm -hmm. uh, the UK with Brexit, you have Gert Wilders who's in sure. the Netherlands, right. Poland, mm -hmm. um, those are right-wingers. But actually, right. mm -hmm. if you look at the populace in the south, mm -hmm. you're talking about Beppe Grillo, oh, okay. Pablo right. Rodriguez who's mm -hmm. in Spain, right. uh, you look at Syriza in, of course, in yes. Greece, right. all right. of those are left-wing right. populace. That's now, the, right. the interesting bit is the mm -hmm. left-wing populace mm -hmm. are, they are thwarted by the EU system. Right. Okay. Right. The the, the right-wing populace are not necessarily saying that the EU system uh, in terms of you know the neoliberal bent is mm -hmm. is wrong. We just want right. fewer immigrants and things like that. Right. The left wing populists are saying that the, there's a core to the European system as it's developed right. that we want to change. Right. Uh, Zariza being a perfect example sure. of that. Sure. And what's happened is is they've run up against uh, the juggernaut, the EU juggernaut, which has right. beaten them down. That's right. And said, in fact, we're not going to seed ground to your ideological right. bent. If you look at Greece as a perfect example, mm -hmm. uh, Alex Cyprus, who right. is the head of Zariza, right. he came in uh, with uh, great popular backing, right. and he, he said, we're not going to do uh, what you, the EU, want us to do. Right. We want to do X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. which is part of a more uh, progressive left-wing platform. Right. Right. The EU smacked it down. They right. said, we're going to withdraw funding for your banks. Right. We actually hold you, we, we can you know, put our, our, our boot on your neck we're holding you and hostage. strangle you. Right. 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 Uh, either you submit or your whole right. uh, financial system collapses. Sure. And so they submitted. Right. Right. So I think that w part of the reason that you have a a difference is, is, is that the left-wing populists have actually bucked the system. They've right. actually, uh, you know, been, they've seen fundamental differences right. with what they believe should be and what the system is, uh, is doing, and the right-wing populists are less so, though I sure. think Marine Le Pen, she, in the past, she right. had been a little bit more uh, negative on the system right. as well. I guess in that last French election, she more or less dropped whatever opposition she had expressed exactly. to French membership. Right. Exactly. And now, yeah. remember, the only right-wing populists who have expressly gone out and said, we don't like the system, mm -hmm. are the right-wingers in the UK who uh, went for breakfast and we see what's happening. Sure, They're sure. just getting hit over right. the head, you know, like crazy. And of course, Britain has always had this very ambivalent relationship toward the rest of Europe anyway, so clearly they were feeding off, off of that in part. Exactly. Right. And right. so ultimately, they found that they're in the same situation as the left-wing populace, right. and that is, is, is that uh, the EU as a system, uh, you know, sees an existential threat, and right. they have mm -hmm. therefore made right. sure that uh, these uh, individuals will pay the price. Right. And in fact, just getting back to the Greek and the other Southern European left of center populists, there's no great anti-immigrant feeling there, whatever. I, I recall that the Greeks have complained that just because of their location, mm. they've, they've been shouldering too much of the burden of accepting migrants, of hosting migrants. But it seems there's no fundamental problem with that principle of free movement. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that the, the left-wing populists, because of who they are, they have not put that into their platforms. Right, right. There are right-wing populist groups mm -hmm. that can put that into their platform, mm -hmm. but they haven't won the day. Like, for instance, True. in Greece, there's a right-wing uh, group that's represented in the Greek parliament mm. uh, that, is, that has Nazi sort of ties mm. and that is anti-immigrant. I but see. they are not popular in the same, Golden Dawn. They're right, 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 right. They're right. not popular in, right. uh, in the way that Zariza was popular. Right. And part of the reason is, is because, uh, you know, the Greeks, they, they see that as, uh, you know, there's a history with Nazis and so forth. Sure, sure. So I think right. that uh, we're, not, we're not there. And Spain has been quite welcoming too. Right? Relatively speaking. Sure, yeah, I mean, right. obviously, when we say welcoming, mm -hmm. what we mean is, is, is that, you know, it's not the, the, the populist groups that are anti-immigrant aren't the ones that are rising to the top. Right, exactly. I mean, the people who are there, they, you know, and Italy is the same way, there is opposition mm -hmm. because the infrastructure has been, uh, to a certain degree, overrun. And I was in Greece, as an mm -hmm. example, uh, during the refugee crisis, and I could see mm -hmm you know, in train stations and so right. forth, how Just, the whole thing was. And I saw, you know, women uh, bringing clothes to people, mm -hmm. bringing food to the immigrants sure. and so forth. Sure. But, you know, at the same time, there was, right. there was an overall feeling of our system can't cope with this. It's not exactly. necessarily that they were saying to themselves, um, we can't cope because we want them and, and we want them out. It was right. more that we're actually experiencing deprivation right, right now. Right. And this is actually making our deprivation even worse. Sure, it's, sure. it's the Northern Europeans up right. here who are creating the problem. Right. And it, it's almost solidarity in that sense. You know, these right. guys, uh, uh, we would want fewer of them but we're also getting right. kicked right. in a certain way. Right, it, right. It. We're also victimized. Right. So it, that, that's really something. Now, there's one other, it seems, very important difference between the European and U.S. populist movements, uh, it seems anyway, and that is that when it comes to Europe, we've got these apparently strong separatist impulses which are seeing their greatest expression in Spain and Catalonia with mm. the secession crisis that continues there. Now, I think it's, it's pretty obvious why we're not seeing movements of that strength here in this country because the United States has simply been more politically unified, although California periodically talks about leaving, Texas periodically talks about leaving, <laughs> but those, those movements, those referenda uh, drives don't seem to really go anywhere. Who knows what will happen in the future, but, but, but the question, I guess, that that, that Catalonia raises is how widespread are these movements now and how widespread could they become? I think that it really is about language and culture mm -hmm. beyond anything else. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the interesting bits, and I, I would say a great bit about the United States, is, is that there's a great uh, homogeneity Mm -hmm. uh, culturally speaking, sure. meaning that you know anyone who integrates into America, uh, relatively speaking, uh, you are going to get uh, pretty much the same uh, in Chicago as you are in New York as you are in uh, Idaho, right. relative to what you would get in Germany. Mm -hmm. For right. example, in Germany, if you live in the northwest of Germany. You might speak what's called Plattdeutsch. Uh, uh, and in Bavaria, which is in the southeast, mm -hmm. you would speak uh, Bayerisch. And uh, those languages are actually mutually unintelligible. Wow. I didn't so know if it. you lived in the north and mm -hmm. you were only speaking that language, no high German, right. let's say back in the 1940s or the 1930s, right. and you went to Bavaria and you right. tried to speak to people in Bavaria who only spoke their language, you have no idea what right. each other is saying. Right. And that's even within one country. Right. In the United States, it's, it, it's right. completely different than that. And of course, Germany, its own political unification is a relatively recent historical phenomenon. Exactly, 1871, sure. right. Italy, 1861. Right. And even yes. though you know, in Spain, it it's, goes way back uh, to Ferdinand and Isabel, the sure. truth of the matter right. is, is that places like the Basque country, Catalonia, right. you know, they've 
they speak a different language. They have yes. a different culture, yes. so to speak. Right. For me, what this uh, brings out is the whole concept of the United States of Europe, how fanciful it is in the mm -hmm. sense that, uh, you know, if you're Spanish, uh, and, and even in Spain, you know, we're talking about Catalonia, Catalonian, if you're Spanish, yeah. you don't feel European in the sense that you feel great affinity for sure. the Germans in the same way that as an American, if you're from uh, Texas and someone's from New York, you feel American vis-a-vis, sure. -vis, you know, a, uh, a, a British person or someone from Venezuela. Right. I think that, you know, the equivalent in the United States would be the United, the, you know, if you took North America yeah. from uh, you know the Panama Canal mm. all the way up to Canada, and mm -hmm. you put it in one bag, right. like one bucket. Really, culturally speaking, those are very different sure, places. Sure, exactly. So my view is is, is that uh, you're, whenever the economy turns down, these um, these cultural differences manifest themselves as a us versus them. Right. Because this is how people react sure. when, t when you know, you circle the wagons when things right. go down, and then it and the us versus them comes out in a way that is more aggressive and much more sort of uh, you know standoffish than it would be if if things were done uh, if the economy were going well. Now you just described the notion of the United States uh, of Europe as being fanciful, mm -hmm. yet that seems to be the, the basic direction that Europe's leadership seems to want to head, and in fact, from what I read anyway, the reaction to whatever success has been achieved by populism seems to be, we're going to double down. Mm -hmm. We're going to push integration even harder and, and perhaps build on this Franco-German core that, that seems to be renewed with the election of Mr. Macron in France, with, with Mrs. Merkel clearly a very strong champion of European unity, European economic integration. Is that realistic? Are they just, just blowing smoke here? Do they themselves take that prospect seriously, that they can push through more cohesive integration than, in fact, than than even they already have. Yeah, I think you know Merkel. She talks about more Europe. Yeah, uh, and that that's a, a phraseology uh, that people use because I mean, first of all, in terms of the European system, for it to work, honestly, it has there has to be more Europe mm -hmm. in the same right. way that there's uh, there's a system in the United States which is much more integrated than the system in Europe. The system they have is a halfway house between national, a national system mm -hmm. and a, uh, you know, a, a system like the United States, uh, what we have. Right. And the reason they have to do that is because they're not really a United States of Europe, right. they're various countries. Mm -hmm. But of course, since the system won't work with more integration, right. then you, you, you have a problem. The problem is, is do you really want to give up your cultural, your national identity right. for this European super state, right. which you don't feel any sort of affinity, affinity for? Right, right. Um, the, you know, people would say that the bureaucrats in, in Europe or in Brussels, they want to do this to usurp power. Mm -hmm. Okay, that might be, but I think really what it boils down to is they understand that it's not going to work unless right. they, ha they centralize things a little bit more. Right. And, and, and then you have this trade-off. Right, and yet it seems like these plans for even further, even deeper integration are too ambitious, at least for the, for the foreseeable future. So the grand question becomes, what happens, what happens to Europe? Does it, does it fall apart to a greater extent economically, is the single currency something that can survive, in your opinion, much longer? Or will some, some very significant accommodations to national sovereignty have to be made? Those are great questions, and you know, no one knows. I mean, well, let me just say, before I, I go into greater detail, that uh, you, we wouldn't necessarily have expected the euro to survive the Greek crisis already. You know, yeah. you would have th mm -hmm. thought if the Greeks didn't get kicked out of the, or leave voluntarily right. from the euro, that you know, then perhaps the Europeans can get through any crisis. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's so weakened now after 
you know, people are, are beaten down. That One more they, jolt could finally, could, yeah. So there are two strains of thinking about right. that. What I would say with regard to more Europe is, is that we have to be clear, when we talk about more Europe, we're not yeah. speaking of uh, people like Wolfgang Schäuble, who's, who used to be the German finance minister, pushing for more integration. Uh, what he's pushing for right. and what these people are pushing for is a economic model that must be adhered to I first right. and then more integration. And right. so what we're, what we're seeing is, is people from the Netherlands or Austria, Germany mm -hmm. saying, what we want is you, Spain, right. uh, Italy, various other countries, to follow this economic model. And mm -hmm. once you follow this model, because it's made us uh, as rich right. as we are right. and as economically successful as we are, you will also be economically successful and rich. Right. And then the, our citizens who are now voting for right-wing populist parties right. will not vote for them. They will see that actually we're not going to bail you guys out. Right. There's going to be no bailout right. and that we're all one big family. Right. And then we will actually have integration. And what does that mean? It means that we will have a European uh, a monetary fund mm. which allows us to deal with the crises. It means that we mm. will have one overarching banking uh, regulator mm. that then is able to resolve banks across different places and we will have one um, rescue scheme. You know like right. in the United States if well, one bank goes bankrupt in right. Iowa Right. then actually it's the FDIC which right. steps in, and that's a federal. Sure, right. right. On the European level, they want that as well. But the Germans mm -hmm. would say, we're not, we're not down with that. Right. You know, Wolfgang Schäuble would say, I don't want that until right. we know that you're on board with the economic model uh, that we're, we're using right now. Sure, because they don't want, want to see this, whatever rescue programs become approved, turn into one grand exercise in what economists call moral hazard, basically rewarding failure. Right. And so, I mean, the, 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 uh, the narrative that's built up uh, as a result mm -hmm. of the crisis in places like uh, Greece and Spain is, is that the southern Europeans in particular, let's forget about Ireland because, you know, when you add them in, then it makes the narrative more difficult. Uh, and, and so that's why I believe these narratives are false. In mm -hmm. the southern states like Spain and, and Greece, they say these people are oppressing us and not giving us the freedom to be able to resolve our problems. Right. In the north, in places like Germany, they're saying we're bailing you guys out. We're taking our hard right. money, our hard money right. through uh, the, the, you know, we, the, the Germans, we actually went through a period where we said no w wage hikes. Do you remember that? Yeah. From right. 2005 to, you know, 2000 right. and whenever, we didn't get any money. We right. Germans. And now right. we're paying for you too. Right, right. We're not going to do it. Right. So right. That, that, that's the narrative that's, that's, sure. that's going. And this sure. is what's fueling right-wing populism in places right. like Germany. Right. Fascinating. Well, now I'd like to turn to what I think is, is going to be recognized as a very significant contribution that you've made to this entire debate or, 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 simp or simple discussion about populism, and that is what you've characterized as the effect that crony capitalism has had mm. in mm -hmm. fueling this phenomenon on both sides of the Atlantic. So I'd love for you to, to explain exactly what you mean by that. Yeah, so I mean, you, if you go back to all the things that we're, we were talking about with regard to Germany mm -hmm. and following our model, mm -hmm. uh, to a certain degree, you can call this a, a neoliberal, uh, you know, market forces type of model. Right. And, and when, when this model was begun uh, in its infancy, Jimmy Carter, as an example, in the 1970s was a proponent of deregulation. Absolutely. Actually, deregulation began under Jimmy That's Carter, right. That's not right. under Ronald Reagan. That's right. You know, you had people like Paul Sangas, people like Bill Bradley. Gary Hart. Uh, Gary Hart, right. mm -hmm. who were proponents of this type of uh, neoliberal deregulation type right. of activity. Unfortunately, what's happened is, is, is that, and this is as true in Europe as it is in um, the United States, is, is that deregulation uh, has also been accompanied by a lack of uh, regulatory oversight. Mm. And it's also been uh, accompanied by a decriminalization of, uh, of white collar crime. Mm. And it's given 
uh, corporations who are now globalized mm -hmm. the incentive to lobby for their interests right. in a world in which we see diminishing economic returns uh, for you know, macro policies. Right. So when you have you know, 2 percent growth mm -hmm. because of macro policies, and you got, uh, that's not a whole lot of growth. Right. So mm -hmm. what are you going to do with those macro policies? The crony capitalist would say, right. you know what, this is an opportunity for us to get in mm -hmm. there and to actually you know, get some of those sure. uh, benefits, those macro policies towards us. Sure. Perfect example mm -hmm. is the Republican tax bill. Mm -hmm. Now, the Republican mm -hmm. tax bill in the U.S. Congress could be a bill that says, let's cut payroll taxes as an example. Right. Let's just use one example. Mm -hmm. These payroll taxes will, uh, let's make it so that we cut mm -hmm. both sides of the payroll tax. The company right. gets a reduction in their taxes mm -hmm. and the individual gets a reduction in their right. taxes. Mm -hmm. And as a result, you, you know, whether you're a Keynesian who believes you know, we need more spending or whether you are right. a, a supply sider who believes that you need more investment, right. you get both sides of the coin. Right, exactly. But that's not what they're doing. Right. What they're doing right. instead is they are um, you know, reducing corporate taxes, mm -hmm. they're getting rid of the inheritance tax, right. and all of this money is flowing disproportionately to the wealthy. Right. And these are the exact same people who are lobbying for this to happen. Right. So this mm -hmm. is how it works, not only in terms of tax reform, <coughs> right. but throughout in terms of different types of activities. So this is what I mean when I say that the, the playing field is tilted. We're right. in a, an era of deregulation as a crony capitalism. Now, you, you did have a very substantial protest against this, uh, this concentration of both political and, their, or, or I should say, this concentration of economic and therefore political power. In this country, a few years back, after the financial crisis broke out, when the Great Recession struck, in the, the, the so-called anti-Wall Street movement, the anti-1% movement. Um, did we see anything similar to that in Europe, aside from whatever inevitable, I guess, echoes of that emerge because groups like a, a public citizen have got, uh, might have you know, worldwide chapters? Was it something that European publics really, uh, at least to a significant extent, grasped onto? I think that they did, mm -hmm. uh, uh, but again, the, the constraining force was the EU uh -huh. in that. Uh -huh. uh, you know, in places like Iceland in particular, you know, people went to jail. I think that people went to jail in Britain. So to a certain degree, you could say that there was more, so there, was a, uh, there was less decriminalization right. there. Uh, however, you know, there was, a, there was great um, uproar within right. the populace about mm. what, what had happened. Right. But what are you going to do about it? I mean, is it that we have to change the EU structures, et cetera? Right. So ultimately, I think that uh, um, when you saw the Beppe Grios, the Five Star Movement, right. you know, uh, Zariza, et cetera, they, they just didn't get anywhere, these types right. of things. Right. And, um, and I think that uh, at the end of the day, Ultimately, what the Europeans could say is actually what's happened here is really America's fault. Really, mm. you know, America mm. created a financial crisis that went global, and we're mm. just trying to recover from that. Right. Uh, but it, it has nothing mm. to do with us. Right, right. Um, here in the States in recent months, I've actually been a little surprised and a little encouraged by the fact that there's more talk about enforcing antitrust law mm -hmm. more energetically. There's more concern expressed about the declining levels of competition, the rise of, very, of various monopolies, oligopolies. Um, I think it's very far from critical mass, but certainly many more voices, and in fact, even in many more establishment voices have been talking about it more seriously. I was amazed to see at the very end of the Obama administration, um, the Council of Economic Advisors come out with a report warning about the, uh, the possible dangers of what they saw as very seriously declining levels of competition and greater levels of, of concentration. 
across the board in this economy, industry after industry. And, and that seems to have, uh, have gotten a few legs. I'm not mm -hmm. sure how far it'll go. But in Europe, when I read about antitrust, the main activity that I see is European regulators going after their American uh, um, technology giants. I'm not hearing much about European regulators going after gigantic European companies. Right. Is that fair or? Uh... I think mean, it's fair to say that they're going after uh, American companies because uh, Americans are using the tax system. Mm -hmm. Disproportionately, it's American companies using the European tax system in order to minimize tax. And obviously, mm -hmm. you know, since it's, these are foreign entities, it's easier to deal with foreign entities than your own entities. They, yeah. they have done with their own entities, but uh, the, those entities do not, those co corporations do not benefit as much right. as the Americans would from getting a be a beneficial tax treatment in Europe. Right. And so ultimately, I think it's a matter, of, a matter of circumstance. When you think about the Netherlands, you think about Ireland and American companies using those, uh, those places right. as bases in order to minimize their tax. Right. That's really what the driving force is, rather right. than antitrust. Right. Uh, but right. when, you, when you talk about antitrust, like Google and, and Microsoft, right. I think that ultimately those are the places where antitrust is, is headed. You right. know, uh, in terms of European antitrust on manufacturing, on right. retail, we're at a point where I don't think that those are big issues. Mm -hmm where the issues are, are in the new spaces of, right. uh, of uh, competition, and that's in technology. Sure. And American companies are leading in technology. So Google, uh, Microsoft in the, in the past, and now uh, Facebook and companies right. like that. The concern is, is, is that we're now facing issues with them that we used to face with right. these other companies. Uh, w the Europeans feel like we've, we've got, got it sorted out with these other companies. Right. Uh, but we don't have it sorted out with technology. And the right, same right. should be true over mm -hmm. here in the United States, right. that we don't have it. Right. But I think that, you know, my view is, is that we are less concerned about that because we want to champion uh, American companies in and, that space. And we, want, we believe in unfettered innovation, although clearly there's been some pushback, even on the right, even among, among Republican senators, about the, these technology giants, um, in part because their, their political sympathies ha, ha, have been relatively progressive, but also because they have become such an integral part of every dimension of our lives, including politics, that again, even your so-called free market mainstream conservatives appear to recognize that, quote, something has to be done, unquote, not that they know what it is. Right. Let, let me give you an example, example of, the, uh, of the problem that you, you face, okay? Uh, now, it's easy to get someone on antitrust with regard to big spaces. Like, right. for instance, the Europeans were getting Google on antitrust with regard to travel mm -hmm. uh, and how they would um, uh, they would benefit themselves at the expense right. of independent co companies. Mm. What about in antitrust in terms of merger type of activity? Mm. Uh, and a, a perfect example of this would be uh, I use two services on mm. my Android uh, phone. They are uh, Wonderlist, which is a, li a task a list that you could do, and the, another one is SwiftKey, which is a keyboard that I could use instead oh. of the default keyboard I, I on Android. Now, I, I'm using these because both of these companies, after I, I bought them, mm -hmm. uh, or these particular products or used these products, mm -hmm. were taken over by Microsoft. Ah. Uh, and what, what's happened is, is, is that you know, Microsoft got to scale, Google got to scale, right, right. and because they have deep pockets, they can say, here's innovation right here. Let's buy that innovation. Let's buy the innovation, right. right. So before that particular uh, innovator has an mm -hmm. ability to scale, for right. example, WhatsApp with regard to Facebook or right. Instagram, sure. let's buy it out. Right. And right. so uh, you, you are faced now with two uh, places of antitrust. One is right. actual 
we're thwarting competition, right. and, and now we're going to go after you, which is what the Europeans are doing mm. with Google in right. particular. Uh -huh. And the second one is, uh, is antitrust from a merger perspective. Are these right. mergers anti-competitive, right. uh, and are we going to stop them? And I think that what we're seeing in technology is not uh, the, the Facebook, Google type of, of, of collections, right. mm. which would have been the equivalent of, say, you know, uh, Baker Hughes getting together with Schlumberger yeah, right. mm -hmm. in oil services. Right, right. You, you would stop that from yeah. happening. Yeah, sure, sure. But instead what we're seeing is Microsoft hoovering up these smaller companies right. and increasing their dominance across right. a wide swath of spaces right. using uh, their, the platforms where they do have semi-monopoly power right. to sort of spread right. out into these other spaces right. as a result of that. And in fact, I think I recall reading over the last week that uh, uh, there are research findings now showing that in Silicon Valley, startups are just not succeeding at the rate that they had before, primarily because they're worried that, that if they ever do start you know, to succeed, um, they are either going to be stamped out in some fashion you know, by larger companies or They'll get such and they'll get such an attractive buyout offer uh, that they'll simply have no choice but to throw in that towel and give up whatever dreams of uh, of, of remaining independent that they might have had. Right. And 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 that that really does go against um, that whole Silicon Valley myth or Silicon Valley ethos of, uh, oh, there's this geek, he graduated from Stanford, and he's been working in his, in a folks, in a basement, and he's come up with the, the, this miraculous in the invention. And that may be coming less and less common. But, you know, I'm, I'm positive in the that, sense that, uh, you know, they will, if they get bought out, you know, like the WhatsApp people got bought out mm -hmm. for something like $17 billion, yeah. $19 billion, uh, that's 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 a positive story. WhatsApp still is in existence. Okay. You know they're using it. People more and more people are using it than ever before. Uh, you know that's a, a startup success. So if if that's you if you your intention is to uh, to go until maybe you get bought out, right. then on some level innovation uh, is succeeding. I succeeded. As a result right. Of that. Sure. 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 Now. One very fundamental question that the entire West faces um, is whether or not these uh, populist movements are not only here to stay, but whether they can evolve into full-fledged challenges to the existing party structures. And that's certainly uh, a major question here in the U.S., um, which really has no recent history, in fact, no history at all, of successful third-party movements. Right. They just have not emerged. Um, in Europe, obviously, you've got more multi-party systems, but I still have the impression that, uh, that populist forces have not emerged as full-fledged challengers, except to the extent that they seem to have elbowed the mainstream left out of the picture to a remarkable extent. Well, I mean, use Donald Trump as an example here and, and talk about it from the regulatory perspective that you, you were using before. Mm -hmm. I'm not optimistic, honestly, about uh, the Trump administration's regulatory bent. A perfect mm -hmm. example is in, uh, is in local uh, communications. Right. That Sinclair, a company right, right, that sure. is now being allowed to hoover up a bunch of uh, local right. uh, media. Right. Do we want that? I say we don't, but the right. Trump administration doesn't exactly. seem to look at it that way. No, My right. view is is that uh, in America, uh, it's very difficult, as you said, to go with a third party. Mm -hmm. We had Ross Perot. Right. We had um, you know Buchanan at some point uh -huh. uh, try to do third party. Right, type John of stuff. Anderson and. Exactly. Right. None of these worked uh, uh, in the same way that Macron worked in, right. uh, in France. He was a third party candidate, as you had, had started to say, although I would still argue that his policies, were at, least by, at least by American standards, were pretty mainstream. Right, definitely. Yeah. I, I agree with okay. that. And so, uh, you know, instead what's happened is, is we've gotten a third party candidate 
entering through the party apparatus, right. uh, Donald Trump, right. and then using uh, the 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 um, the populist rhetoric. Right. But when we actually see policies that have come, uh -huh. they've been very much uh, mainline Republican type of policies. And the right. question then becomes, why is that? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are two possible answers for that. Answer number one is that Donald Trump uh, does not have the policy chops or the people around him right. uh, to necessarily drive through these populist initiatives that he could drive through. Mm. That's answer number one, right, which, right. It, which is positive for Donald Trump saying that, right. you know, he wants to he do wants it. He wants to do it, but, but right. he, he right. just, uh, he, he's not familiar with the government enough. Right. Number two is, is that Trump actually really wasn't a populist. He's basically, he was really a plutocrat uh -huh. Right. who was using populist rhetoric in order to get himself into a position of power. And now that he's in power, right. uh, his true colors are, are going to show, and he's much mm. more aligned yeah. in an economic upturn right. with, the, uh, with uh, the, his, his party. So right. what would be the case in a downturn? Who would yeah. Donald Trump be if the economy were souring? Right. Would he be the populist right. uh, that uh, he campaigned as? or? Uh, would he be doing the exact same thing he's doing now? Right. And th that's the question for when the recession does happen. Sure. So with regard right. to could we see a third party, mm. I, I doubt whether we would mm. see it uh, in the United States, but right. could we see a populist like Donald Trump right. In right. The main, yeah. within the main two parties right. doing populist things? Yeah. I think we'd have to wait for an economic recession before sure. we sure. can answer that question. Sure. One other problem that I think Trump or anyone else, even without whatever personal idiosyncrasies you might think are holding him back and inhibiting his effectiveness, one other problem that he's faced, and again, it would be faced by anybody, is that um, there has been no successful effort here in the States to create any serious counter policy establishment. Mm -hmm. So when an outsider actually wins a presidential election and he's faced with the task of staffing his administration, there's literally no there there. There's no one to go to. Well, you know, the reason I think is, is that it, we, it's like a pendulum swing mm -hmm. in the sense that, as we noted earlier, mm -hmm. uh, we, we had the Songuses and the Bradleys right. and the hearts of the world right. who were on board from the Carter administration 40 yes. years ago right. with deregulation. From a mainstream perspective, uh, right. you're not going to find people who don't buy into the markets, uh, market efficiency type right. of paradigm. Mm -hmm. right. So not in the Democratic Party, not in the Republican Party. Yeah. You definitely will have to go out much outside, and those people are not going, you know, you're not going to choose those people. Bernie right. Sanders even. Mm -hmm. But I mean, when you listen to him talking about the deficit, his rhetoric is, is very mainline. Sure. None, you know, I know people who worked with Sanders mm. who had a, uh, a Dick Cheney sort of deficits don't matter type oh, of right. thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they, don't, they do know that deficits matter because they create inflation. Right. But if you listen to Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. he's not saying that. Right. So even right. people who we consider to be populist and outside the mainstream right. really are in the mainstream. It's so I, I don't sure. think that you're going to get there until uh, it's clear that the, the pendulum has swung too far as a result of economic calamity. 2008 wasn't enough. It seemed, which, which, it which seems. is amazing. Which is amazing when you think it about is. it. I mean, because I would argue that 1929 and then again 1971 to 73 was mm. enough. So 29 uh, put an end to uh, the first wave of globalization right. and mm -hmm. so-called liberalization back then. Right. And we had a much more regulated, sure. much more sort of national boundary right. uh, type of global infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And that worked. We didn't have sure. any uh, economic calamities for a period of 40 years. Right. So that's a great thing. Mm -hmm. But eventually that system broke down for right. various reasons. And by the time you got to 71, 73, we ushered in the new year. Mm -hmm. right. And this new age that we've ushered in right. has lasted until now. And 2008 wasn't enough, apparently, no, it seems. To, to, to break that. Right. But it seems to me that the pendulum is swinging so far the other direction mm -hmm. that uh, you're, you're going to have a change. But it's only going to happen as a result of 
unfortunately, uh, you know, some sort of crisis. Right. I, I think um, certainly in the U.S. there's very little, uh, there's very little record of qualitative change happening without, uh, without some genuinely terrible, uh, genuinely ter terrible precursors. And one hopes that w that would not be necessary, but uh, sadly history teaches otherwise so far. Um, I'm wondering if, if, if you see much hope that, uh, that again, on either side of the Atlantic, that mainstream political forces will come up with adequate responses to the legitimate grievances um, that voters who have responded to you know, populist candidates have actually, have, actually, have actually been expressing? Or are they so hidebound that there's no I, I don't think there will be a response. Uh, let me give you an example. Oh. Um, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, I, I'm not going to say whether the, yeah. these individuals are right or wrong, but I, I, you know, I speak Dutch and I was watching the campaign. Mm -hmm. Uh, when they had the elections in early 2017. Mm -hmm. And so uh, on the main uh, evening news program, they were uh, looking at the lives of one working class couple. Mm -hmm. Now, these were a working class couple who was working, but mm -hmm. they weren't bringing in enough income to right. actually even put food on the table. Wow. They actually were going to food banks on a regular basis to supplement their uh, grocery bills because groceries were too expensive for them. Mm -hmm. And the, the guy of the couple said that, you know, why, sh you know, like I'm a, a Dutch citizen, I live here and I I'm going to this food bank. Uh -huh. I can't even clothe myself and feed myself. Yet when these immigrants come here from uh, Syria or wherever they're coming from right. to escape, uh, 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 war in their countries right. immediately right. they get everything right. Incl not just education and all right. the and health care you know which I have but also you know food I mean they're right. completely taken right. care of right. how is this a a, a fair world mm -hmm. now without going into whether his uh, his worldview is correct mm -hmm. this is how people feel sure sure and I believe that it's the, it's the need of the politicians to make sure that they don't feel that way. Right. Because this is what's creating division within the economy, in society, and right. it's also feeding uh, the need of people like him to go for more radical uh, political alternatives. Right. And right. I don't believe yes. that the Dutch politicians, the mainline Dutch politicians, mm -hmm. are sufficiently addressing the points that he's making, nor will they. Right, and right. so I believe that you know, when the economy turns down, when bad things happen economically, right. that's when we'll see the next right. crisis, and then we'll see what the response is at that particular time. And I hope that I'm not appearing too partisan here, but as I see it, the most revealing moment of the 2016 and American presidential election came, must have been about a month before the actual vote, when Hillary Clinton was being asked by some journalist, how are things going? And she, she simply exclaimed at some point, why aren't I 15 points ahead? <laughs> and I think she really had no idea why she wasn't 15 points ahead, because she was not connecting right. with what was motivating so many voters even voters who had, who had, for many generations, voted Democratic. And ultimately, uh, her inability to answer that question, I think, uh, I think cost her. So, Now, one other point that you've raised that I find extremely interesting, especially as, as it, it relates to the emergence of uh, populism here, but also mm -hmm. Europe. Um, you, if, if I understand y your arguments, correctly, you've maintained that, um, that the main driving forces are not xenophobia, they're not racism, they're really economic. Right. And I don't think that there's anybody who can legitimately deny that populists on both sides of the Atlantic have attracted some very unsavory characters. Oh, yes, definitely. But leaving them aside, you seem to think that, 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 that they really do not represent um, what's genuinely troubling so many voters 
who have, who have, who have responded to this uh, populist appeal, whether it's from Trump or from Wilders or from anybody over in Europe on the, the, the right especially. Right. So, I mean, you know, uh, l let me give you a longer answer on sure, this because sure, uh, there's a historical uh, period. You know, I'm connected to Germany. Mm -hmm. and I want to use the German example. And then there was a recent article in Politico that I think is very interesting mm -hmm. and revealing about this uh, from the American perspective. Starting with the German side, historically, you know, uh, you know, I know people. I, I was a diplomat there, and I interviewed uh, some people who were uh, expelled from the United States, uh, uh, you know, because of Nazi connections and so forth. And um, I was integrated into families, mm. you know, where people died on the Eastern Front mm. and these kinds of things. Uh, and so I had a good sense of the, you know, the history of right. the Nazi period, both, you know, from a real perspective, but also from a historical perspective, having read about it. And my sense is, is, is that uh, when politicians waited until the last moment or they were unable to fix the economy, right in came someone who was going to fix it. Riding on that white horse. Exactly, right. named Adolf Hitler. Now, the people who were supporting Hitler weren't necessarily uh, anti-Semites. Mm. In fact, many of them didn't even know Jewish people mm. whatsoever. No Jews lived in their area. Mm. Uh, but they were willing to overlook uh, the clearly disgusting and uh, racist right. part of his ideology right because he was riding in on that white horse. Right. And before you knew it, uh, he had taken over. Right. Not only had he taken over, but he took over uh, socially and culturally mm -hmm. as well. And many of the people who were initially not mm -hmm. on his side with regard to the ideology right. moved onto his side. Mm -hmm. So if you uh, take that to the present day American context, mm -hmm. there was an article in Politico it was talking to Trump voters. Mm -hmm. Uh, and whether they were happy with what he's been doing or not, right. and you know he had they were mixed reviews. Mm -hmm. But the and and the article ended with a sort of shocking racist comment about the NFL mm -hmm. um, uh, equating uh, to uh, the N word for life. Oh wow! Um, Oof. And wow. Oof. which is you know a, a, you know, a, a, and they were laughing about it. Mm. Now. That's clearly racist. The real question is, right. are those people racist? Yeah. Were they always racist? And if you read the article and what right. people uh, were saying, what you would have seen is, is, is that some of these people voted for Barack Obama in 2008 right. and right. 2012, or right. in 2008 or 2012. Right. What happened to switch them from N-word for life right. NFL yeah. to uh, from right. voting for Barack Obama, right. the that's first a pretty black big, American president. That's a pretty big journey. That's a pretty that's big a journey. Weird. And my answer is, it's not racism. Right. My answer right. Is, is, is that, yes, in every society, there are latent uh, you know, uh, frictions right. culturally. Sure. We see mm. this in Catalonia, mm. uh, or we see it in the Basque country in Spain. Right. They're there. But when bad things happen economically, when the chips are down, right. suddenly they become much more important. It does seem to be. And right. then that's when a populist who has a divided rhetoric right. can actually uh, benefit from that. Sure, sure. Let's close with one final Europe-oriented question, but it's got a big U.S. angle too, and that is, um, well, actually, let's make it a two-part question, okay? First of all, what kinds of outcomes concerning Europe's future, how extensively integrated it might become or not, what outcomes would you judge to be in America's own best interest? And then secondly, um, what kind of leverage or simply influence could the United States wield here? Mm. I would say the, um, the, the optimal outcome in certain ways is uh, short of you know Europe breaking apart in a uh, a peaceful uh, transition way, which mm -hmm. isn't going to happen, right. is a United States of Europe without the economic ideology, mm -hmm. and I don't think that's going to happen either, right. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But I think there's more of a chance of that happening. And what that means is 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 that 
uh, enough of a economic disruption for people to say, look, let's drop the, um, you know, the caveat that you must use our economic model first. Mm -hmm. If we want this system to work and save it, what we need to do is create uh, a safety net uh, mm -hmm. for the financial system and, uh, you know, transfers it between nations that will, at a very base level, you know, take the worst uh, um, economic outcomes off right. the table. Right. It shouldn't be that because um, of uh, a mortgage debt crisis in the United mm -hmm. States that Italy and Portugal uh, suddenly you know, the actual countries themselves, the sovereigns, mm -hmm. are at threat of defaulting. Right, right. Uh, it should be that we, Europe, will be able to, to make, make it happen so that never, ever sure. becomes an issue. Right. And so I, I would like to see a, a system in which you take that completely off the table and there's no quid pro quo. It's right. not like you must do X in right. order to achieve that. Right, interesting. Edward, I'd like to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, you've given us a great deal to, to think about and cogitate over. Um, obviously, uh, we hope that you continue provoking and analyzing. And again, on behalf of the Henry George School, we're so glad you were able to join us for Smart Talk. It's been great. Thank Thanks you very again. much, Alan. Okay. Thank you.